Hello entrepreneurs and thank you for joining another session of Haifa and Boston Tech Webinars Project. Uh, today we have Esteban Gonzalez who's going to talk about branding and the empathy process. Um, I want to just uh, state the fact that we got uh, about $200 voucher for you uh, that you can sign up and uh, receive only for December and only for you. Uh, for Tiru, it's one of our sponsors for this month. Uh, Tiru is a, a platform for content management and you can manage all the content for the, for the upcoming year. So you have a, a sweet year uh, for everyone. Uh, let me just uh, talk a, a bit about our sponsors. Uh, if you want, you can contact them uh, at any time. So first is the Misty MIT Israel program. Its aim is to strengthen the connection between the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Israel. Its main component is a 10 to 12 weeks uh, of internships program for students, researchers, MBAs, and recent graduates from MIT and companies and universities in Israel. This year, MISTI MIT Israel sent over 60 students to Israel. The program can recruit students with specific skill set and from specific fields at MIT. For Israeli companies and labs, this is a unique opportunity to get access to MIT students and information through technology transfer. Currently, MISTI MIT Israel has arrangements to enable MIT students to do 10 to 12 week internships at many labs at universities in Israel and at many companies, including Amdox, IBM, Google, Tether, Portalix, Bright, BrightSource, Orbind, uh, Rambam Hospital, and many other small and medium sized companies. Host companies provide a strip end to cover internship costs. If you are interested uh, in exploring this opportunity to host MIT interns, please contact David Olev, and you have here the address. Let's move to Tiru. Tiru is a solution uh, for content marketing management platform. You have uh, beautiful stuff over there, and you're more than welcome to, to try it. Uh, Tiru.co.il. Uh, they gave us the, the platform, their platform for a full year. And, and that's brilliant. Just for you, for you to try their beta. There is a few uh, small letters, like you have to use it in order to have it for a full year. If you don't use it, you can't uh, have it. Uh, but that's, you'll see how useful it is, and you'll probably just use it. That's the rule. Our next sponsor are uh, Young Adult Center. Uh, the Haifa Municipality presents the Anamales 28, a place for entrepreneurs who want to build their venture. We offer a shared space and good atmosphere. It's all for free. Come and visit. You're more than welcome to uh, contact Yaniv Asas. Biltech Haifa is a monthly meetup that combines both lectures from leaders of the technological entrepreneurship industry and networking event. The event uh, goes on every, uh, it happens on every last Monday of the month. Uh, please check uh, Biltech Haifa in the Facebook. Big is a group of Israeli and American Jewish young adults from the Boston area who care big time about Israel. Our mission is to connect Israeli and American Jewish young adults while facilitating awareness of Israel in the greater Boston uh, in the greater Boston area. Please contact Eliad Shmuel. Eliad is in uh, Boston and uh, he will be glad uh, you know, to receive a few more uh, contacts and to help, of course, always. Uh, Orba Abad uh, is specializing in the management of social networks combined with promotion of websites for medium site businesses. You are more than welcome to contact Or in LinkedIn. A few words. Today, uh, it is very easy to promote businesses uh, websites via social networks and in the right hands what can take a site between 6 to 24 months through Google's landing search engine can be achieved with social networks within just 2 to 6 months and that is promise I guess all about social engagement services for medium sized businesses uh, experience with crafting business pages producing content and managing business pages with directing considerable web traffic in the right direction so you are more than welcome to contact LinkedIn and this is us, Haifa and Boston Tech Webinars Project. Aim is assisting entrepreneurs by informal activities and creating opportunities in order to boost their professional growth. You are more than welcome to contact me or dead, hb.tech.webinars at gmail.com. And that's it. Uh, with no further ado, let's start the Esteban's uh, lecture. Thank you, Odette, for, uh, for having me. I'm delighted to be a part of the webinars, and I'm really looking forward to, to kind of talking to everybody about something that I think that in many situations, it seems that startups kind of 
put as something towards the later stages of what their development is. Um, today I'm, I'm hopefully going to be talking to you and convincing you about why thinking about your brand and thinking about your brand in a particular way is something that, that organizations should be doing from the very beginning of when they're starting to kind of set up and, and beginning to grow and outline what their value proposition is, how they want to uh, make an impact on the market. So first of all, I'm going to introduce myself. My name is Esteban Gonzalez. I'm the founder <coughs> excuse me, and uh, lead strategist of a company called Brand Therapy. We are a, an insight-driven strategy and ideas workshop. Um, we deal with clients from all kinds of different sizes, large and small, from early stage to well, well kind of developed. And basically what we're really all about is using insights uh, to help companies create valuable relationships with their consumers. So I want to start by talking a little bit about brands. Some of this you may know, some of this not. Hopefully it will be in informative either way. When most people in the past thought about the brands, in gen thought about brands in general, they thought about them either as the image or the perception or the whole idea that the brand was trying to project outward into the world. So we had brands like this, which was Chiquita Banana uh, on the left and Marlboro on the right, which were very much built on these icons and personalities that were about a particular image that the brand wanted to project. Today now we know, you know, we have, we have very, technology that's influenced everything, different kind of communications and the convergence of technology and communications. We have brands like Starbucks, all kinds of different things that have made us much more aware that brands are image, but they're really experiences. And on, the, on the right is an example of the way someone has kind of defined what the Starbucks brand is. It's all of these different little things and how they come together in a totality of what, what the brand uh, is in, in our lives. So what that's meant is that Chiquita can think about how it can engage people in kind of interesting ways. So with stickers that it has on its products on its bananas, such as what you see on the left. Or Marlboro can think about particular audiences and the taste of that audience and what those experiences in a Marlboro fashion would really be. Um, in this case, it's really heavily into EMD music and, and the kind of events that people who are attracted to that music um, would attend. So it's also behind the things that we know about Apple. And you know, when we think about Apple, we're not actually thinking about a particular device, or we're not thinking about a particular kind of computer or phone. We're actually thinking about much more about what that brand is promising us um, that it's going to deliver. And what that does is that allows us to, to see and evolve with the company as it changes so that you know, we know that however we express the brand, however we experience the brand, whether it's an iPhone, whether it's in a, an Apple Watch, that we can expect the same things as we've always expected from the brand. When it's done right, the brand is really a touchstone for everything. Uh, everything outwardly, such as the offerings that the organization throws into the world and offers, puts up, out into the world, uh, products, solutions, or combinations of services and solutions, uh, the way it communicates about what it's all about, its look and feel, its, you know, the emails, the messages, the outdoor, any kind of advertising that you see, the experience it creates, whether you're experiencing the brand in a retail setting, whether you're experiencing it in conjunction with other brands, whether you're experiencing it in terms of the training that you as a new employee go through to, to be a member of that company, uh, all the way to the culture, to what's the, the, the way that uh, the, the, the brand is experienced in the world internally. So, you know, how do leadership, how do managers uh, express and, and, and bring the brand to life in the way that they deal all the time with different kinds of audiences? So, in the end of the day, the definition that I use when I talk to clients about what the brand is, really, is this one. The brand is the sum total of all experiences people have with an organization, whether external or internal, a website, packaging, advertising, customer service, hiring policies, or a reputation for being green, innovative, or sustainable. It's really about a relationship. And just like, you know, if we start to think about a relationship and how that 
comes about, you know, and how we want to structure what that relationship really is, is like, if we think about things, you know, very complex things like animals and organisms, you know, we know that you can't really get a complex organism like the elephant you get on the left without understanding all of the building blocks and kind of the, the, the molecular roadmap for what that animal needs to be. Um, you have to invest in understanding all that before you actually get the end result. It's the same thing with defining a brand. So before you can get the brand experience on the right, you know, which talks about all the ways that the brand is, it lives in the world, you need the strategy on the left, which is really the big idea and core principles that guide how the brand is expressed in the world. So in general, most companies, you would think that most companies understand this by now, um, correct? Well, it turns out that this isn't necessarily true, and this is one of the most interesting things you know, about thinking about brands in this way. So you would think in companies who understand that the brand is about a relationship would have very robust pictures of who their audiences are, um, you know, that would be very detailed about what are their motivations and things like that. But we all know that this isn't necessarily true. I mean, even in our daily lives, many times we actually feel that companies are looking at us like this, really interested in us only from the point of view of whether or not we would be willing to engage with them and spend their money for this. So we start to think about, you know, we start to wonder why companies have seemed to project themselves in this way that doesn't have such a detailed understanding of what the consumer is really all about. Um, even ma to make things even more kind of difficult, we start to think about the way organizations are interacting in the world. And, and the truth is, is that they never actually have one single audience. They usually are very complex constellations of multiple types of audiences all involved at the same time. So I put here three examples of different clients that I deal with and the kind of configuration of audiences that they have. So the first one is my client, the National Association of Realtors. And the National Association of Realtors has a leadership structure, volunteer leadership, that's elected by members. Um, they interface with the professional staff, who's also a main kind of audience of, of the, the uh, Realtor.org website. It's serving the members uh, which are, who are either agents or brokers uh, with their particular needs, and they both have very distinct needs, and then both of those are interested in dealing with buyers, home buyers. The second example is an app that, that I've worked with that to help focus that value proposition and kind of the consumer experience there. And their whole business is based on bringing shoppers in a local area uh, in contact with merchants in that area who support causes that the shoppers actually care about. So they were trying to create a platform that all of these three audiences could come together for their mutual benefit and interact and, and, and actually improve the general quality of life in the community. All very different, have different points of view and different, different interests. And finally, at the bottom is really uh, another client that was more in a retail consumer packaged goods it's a company that makes cherry cordials and chocolates for fundraising uh, opportunities for, say, schools and parent-teacher organizations, uh, youth athletics, so little league, soccer league for kids, that they can use these chocolate bars and cordials as a way to raise money to kind of support their athletic programs and their school programs. So that organization, that company, first had to sell to the different brokers out there, which were brokers not only of goods, of, of products, but brokers of fundraising products, who then sold to the individual sponsors, which were in this case either the PTA, the school, or the lead, the district leadership of a particular little league, and then they had to sell to the parents, who were ultimately the sellers, even though the kids would do the legwork, the parents had to approve of it, and then finally, after all of that, gets down to the individual who's going to buy the, the uh, chocolate bar to help support the Little League. All of this is very, very complex. So if, if organizations have very thin views of who their actual consumers are, how can they begin to even broach any of this kind of complexity? It, it certainly can't be because there's not enough data out there about audiences. So when we think about why things aren't the way we would like them in many of our own situations, it can't be because they don't know about us 
enough because data is very plentiful. It's never been easier to gather. It's never been easier to process. In fact, this actually may be one of the reasons why, why they don't have a very clear idea about us, is that they're on one hand overwhelmed with the amount of information about us, but there seems to be right now, even culturally, uh, a misperception that data and analytics are essentially a magic bullet for understanding the consumer. And this isn't necessarily true. Although they're incredibly enlightening, enlightening um, the problem is, is that you can't often get creative ideas about how to engage and activate people simply from data. And this is underlining kind of the point that information isn't always insight. Well, this is a quote by Einstein, which I love, which kind of brings this in a much more poetic way, basically saying not everything that can be counted counts, and not everything that counts can be counted. And we find this very, very true, but we're lucky. We've actually discovered a, what we consider an antidote to this situation, and that is an empathy. Empathy is the ability for each of us to put ourselves in the shoes of another person and to see the world through their eyes and to see how they would evaluate the situation. And we think that this is, you know, it, it is, is far more valuable uh, for thinking about the different ways that business should operate than I think that, that traditionally businesses have used it. Empathy provides context in a way that many other aspects don't necessarily provide context. It helps us understand what's meaningful from what's just information. So when we think about the different uh, data that we're gathering about behaviors that audiences and consumers are exhibiting, we're able to begin to get a better picture of what's signal and what's noise, what's useful from what's something that's just really nice information about the way the audience behaves. Even more, what it allows us to do is to bring a lot of these skills and um, benefits that we can all bring to the table, uh, allows them to let us leverage them more. So it lets us balance this analytical thinking about whatever the data is gathered about a particular audience or a particular kind of market that's created, and add to that our own emotional intelligence and intuition about what's really going on. Not necessarily to supplant the data, but to begin to add context for how we can use the data in intelligent ways. You know, from the point of view of gathering insights or making, uh, uh, having a richer picture about who, who our audiences are, it makes us, it, it enables us to make much more powerful observations about what's going on with our audiences. So instead of just describing audiences, which is pretty much the norm now, in terms of describing it in terms of demographics and other kinds of, uh, of information that we have, we're able to actually make much more substantive conclusions about what's inside of their individual heads. What makes them tick? How are they thinking about the choices that they have? And how are they deciding what they want to do as they move forward kind of in the world, engaging with products and services? So this is a quote by Bill Drayton, uh, the founder of Ashoka, which is this incredibly fabulous organization that supports uh, social entrepreneurs around the world. It's done some incredible work. But the quote there is, empathy will be like literacy was in the 1300s. Without it, one will be marginalized and unable to function professionally. Which is more and more what we're seeing as we're interacting with our clients. Um, in fact, the, the kind of the true proof of this is that when we work with clients and we bring empathy into the situation where we're defining their brands or defining marketing strategy or defining what they want to do and how they want to evolve their product, one of the things that's really important is they're seeing that uh, all of the possibilities emerge outside of what their, our particular charge is, our particular focus is with the engagement at the time. They're beginning to see so much more that empathy provides a new window on what they're doing and, and it's a window of opportunity. So the first thing that, that we notice right away is that empathy, and we talk to our clients about, is that empathy lets audience speak for themselves. So instead of bringing just what we think audiences care about, and the clients, us, whoever, uh, what we think audiences are all about and what they want, we actually create a way so that the audience can tell us themselves. So. This is an example um, with the app that I mentioned earlier about that was trying to create a localized way that shoppers could search for and evaluate um, merchants based on the different causes that they support. Initially, 
the organization was really focused, and I think this is very applicable to you know startups. Is the the or the organization was really focused on the value proposition between the merchants that wanted to have the ability to kind of coupon and the causes, and they were very focused on that end of the uh, of kind of the whole configuration of the ecosystem. But more and more, as they did more investigation into the process, in, into the technology, and into the way that people would use this, and uh, started looking at who the end, where the value was really going to be created, it very much more was about consumers and creating something that consumers could begin to think about and buy into and incorporate into their daily shopping experiences. So we were able to kind of help shift the organization to think about, you know, to listen to the actual voices of the people who were using the app and what they cared about. Uh, at the same time, empathy challenges biases. This is another really important thing. It challenges biases and in internal interests, embedded interests. So even though um, that the you know, companies think that they usually have a single mind in terms of the way that they should move forward, even small companies, there's disagreements and even shifts within the same people as to we should be doing this versus we should be doing that. And, and this can change sometimes very, very quickly. Um, that kind of conflict or difference of opinions, you know, in general is thought of as kind of negative, but in the setting of using it, of using empathy, what that does is that allows us to have much more interesting and I think much more focused discussions from the point of view of the value that the organization is creating. So an example here is with the Chicago Area Runners Association. Um, uh, CARA is an organization in, in Chicago. It's the third largest runners association in the United States. Um, they are very heavily allied with a lot of very important events. Um, one of them is the Chicago Marathon. That, that organization in general has been kind of focused on uh, has been led by a group of volunteers, voluntary leadership on their board. And most of those people who volunteer are very involved in running from a competitive and kind of elite status. Running is a very important part of their lives and therefore they view CARA as something for people like them. Well, a lot of time, you know, when we think back about the brand and we're trying to define what the brand really was in the Chicago community, it's inherent in the name there. It's really for anyone who runs. So there was a lot of discord in terms of who were the initial and most important audiences that the organization needed to approach? And another, adding more complexity to the to the situation was the fact that one of the big things that CARA offers is uh, kind of training programs for people who want to do the Chicago Marathon or their first half marathon uh, to 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 learn how to train, to learn everything from nutrition to general conditioning and all that kind of stuff. So it's very much kind of focused from this idea of a very serious runner, despite the fact that in the community, it really is saying that it needs to be for pretty much everyone. So bringing empathy into the situation, into the different workshops that we were conducting with the leadership of the organization, helped them take a different point of view and understand that, yes, it, it, you know, the, they really care about the standards and they really care about elites, but as if, if they're thinking about the brand of the organization, they need to extend this and embrace a wider audience. So while they were very good at approaching and talking to Brenda and Heidi, in this case, they weren't really good talking to people who were like runners in college and when they were younger and they were actually returning to running for fitness and for wellness, or people who were really more tied into the social dimensions of what running was really all about. So having the ability to bring those people into the discussion where we talk about what are the principles of the organization to develop a brand were very, very, very important. Another thing, actually, that, that bringing empathy into the discussion of brands and what brand really means to people uh, is another benefit is really that it reveals a lot of the elephants that are sitting in the room that many times organizations kind of develop uh, almost a denial or a blindness to seeing and it brings them and surfaces them in a way that's non-confrontational that's that that everyone can put themselves in in kind of a common point of view and begin to look at the implications for this um, one of the things uh, one of the clients that I work with is a, the, again I mentioned the organization that does the fundraising for little leagues and PTOs 
Um, another aspect of that that organization, or one of the, things, the challenges that they were dealing with, is that their audience was getting increasingly older, and they needed to think, well, you know, because so much of the way people enjoy these these particular products, how can we begin to appeal to people at a at a younger kind of at a younger age level and begin to be more relevant to a younger audience. Um, in, in that case, what we were able to do was we were able to get people to to see that that although the brand was really successful and although that people it was it, it is pretty much the leader, it controls 80% of the market, that if it wanted to remain viable, it had to think of new ways to begin to express itself. And so you know, the elephant in the room at that point was really the status quo. How do we begin to create a larger organization that's mostly manufacturing based to begin to think that, you know, they actually have to start thinking from a much more of a consumer mind. And in that sense, we were able to identify core ideas such as this, this, this concept of being a classic and how the brand can begin to leverage that to kind of surface and become much more relevant to this younger audience. Another important way that empathy and branding benefits uh, companies is that inwardly it creates focus and alignment. You know, the, the thing is, is that all of us know empathy. We know, we feel it, we see it every day when we're kind of interacting. But when it happens in a group, all of a sudden it can become very transformational. It can open people's eyes to all kinds of new possibilities. This is an example of the uh, website for the Chicago Yacht Club. We used our approach to actually help that organization think about what it needed to be in the world and how it needed to communicate what its brand was really all about in the world. In this case, um, the client had a group of 25 individuals. It was a committee of 25 individuals that were all volunteers, they're members, and they were on the committee about the website. And they initially approached the whole question about the way the website should be from the point of view of everyone knew the right answers, everyone had very specific ideas about what needed to be in the website and what didn't need to be in the website. Well, this was a way, you know, working through the process and defining personas about who the members were and the users of the website, it was a way for people to begin to find kind of a common point of view and build consensus around what the most important things were. So while we initially started with a list of about 130, 140 must-haves for the functionality and the features of the website. By the end of the process of going through personas and then discussing the values of what these individual people cared about, um, we were able to reduce that to about 20 items. So that's a, that's a huge accomplishment in terms of um, kind of bringing people together uh, on the, and you know, kind of putting them in a mindset so they understood the value a lot better. At the same time, not just inwardly, but outwardly, focusing on the brand with an empathetic kind of point of view really ensures that you can arrive at that starting space that, that everyone really uh, agrees on. And, and again, it's not necessarily just with communications, or as in the case before with the Chicago Yacht Club, just with the experience. It can be about everything from the products to the different strategy in terms of go to market, to thinking about channels, to thinking about messaging and creative. All of a sudden with this kind of common starting point and ability to access it for everyone within the organization, all of a sudden it can, everything becomes much more, uh, much easier and, and the work becomes much more effective. This is this is an example of the personas that we created for the National Association of Realtors. Now, we created that initially for uh, the website, realtor.org. After about a year and a half of using the personas and helping to kind of redevelop and redesign what that website was really all about, the organization became so uh, in love with essentially these personas and saw that they were addressing a lot of needs that, that before they, the organization didn't really have its handle on, that what the organization did was they blew up life-size images of all of the personas that we created, and in a national meeting, in a national leadership meeting, they actually pointed out that these were the four individuals that the organization needed to be focusing on. So 
it was actually quite a big accomplishment because pre previous to this, although the, they knew that they had a large audience in brokers, they didn't really understand the specific aspects that brokers cared about that were different than agents. Also, they understood that all they, they have a lot of information about the way agents live and what they really care about. But one of the things that they didn't have a sense of were the younger up and coming agents that were heavily using technology and were really looking for the organization to begin to provide digital tools that they could you know, use to conduct their business and to get better known out there by the buyers in the organization. So are in the, in the real estate market. So what this did was it brought a lot of those ideas that people knew kind of anecdotally into one place that everyone could begin to access and it affected everything from the national conventions to the programs that they did for the training brokers to the programs that they did for reaching out to the younger members who were more the kind of the whippersnappers up and coming people um, really aligning everyone in, in, in the process. So I want to tell you a little bit about how we work with empathy with clients so that you can have a little bit better idea of um, how, how you might think about injecting this into the work that you do. So the first thing we do is we actively go out into the world and begin to look at people and how they operate in the world. So we, for the National Association of Realtors, we went to their mid-year conference um, where they have meetings with all the legislators who, you know, with real estate issues and where they begin to articulate all of the things that are important to their membership to see how realtors in these different audiences kind of moved together, how they congregated, what they thought about when they got together as a group. It was really, really enlightening and helped us to identify these different groups that, that I've mentioned to you. This is a picture of some of the work that we did with New Balance. New Balance was doing a campaign directed at, say, college-level runners who are, again, running kind of amateurs. They're not running for their universities. But I wanted to see what they were like. So what we did is we actually visited colleges. This one is for Stanford University, where we knocked on doors and asked people who answered, hey, can, you, can, can we see your closet and talk to you a little bit about the shoes you use? And what you do is you find these incredible nuggets of information. This is someone who runs casually or you know, is in, into running, but not running for the, uh, the, the university. But you can begin to see how important running is with the bibs and all of the different medals and things that, that she does, how, how much presence they, are, they have in her life. This was a product, project that we did with Bear Diabetes Care, um, looking at what different people who are patients uh, with the disease what they, their lives are really like. So what we did is we asked different people, what's, what's essentially in your bag? What do you carry with you? This was for a new kind of glucose monitor, glucose meter, so that to help people um, you know, see what levels their glucose was at so that they could maintain their condition you know, kind of in a health and in an optimal way. And what, it, what we found out there was that people were really, really creative with the way that they thought about the way that they kind of used the, our, our approach to managing their diseases. So things like this, what we're doing when we actually get out and talk to people is we're trying to find these connections between the things that we can measure, such as the demographics and all the transactions and behavioral stuff, and the things that we know internally and that, that are actually much more important as we begin to think about how they make decisions. So how do they develop preference? How do they make connections with brands? Uh, you know, what media? How are they using social? How are their tastes and attitudes manifest in the world? And bringing those things together really helps us understand and then actually talk to the client in interesting ways and in collaborative ways about what this means in terms of the implications of the value proposition of the brand in the world. This is an example, this is a picture from the work that we did in one of the workshops we did with the National Association of Realtors, where we began to take all of these different voices. It's a very large organization. There are about 35 different standing departments. We were really lucky to bring many of them, them into the discussion for the website, and it really helped provide a, a, a very rich base of information so that we could develop the insights that we developed. 
Another thing that doing this kind of thing in a workshop setting does is it gets clients excited. It gets them excited about what they're doing. This is, this is a work session that we did for the app that I mentioned to you about bringing merchants and causes and, and consumers together. They obviously care very much about what they're doing, and if we can harness that, what we can begin to do is we can begin to, to, to make better decisions and make better tools to make better decisions. In this case, we were focusing on who the audience wa was, and what we, were, we did is we developed very detailed pictures uh, about what their lives would be uh, and, and what the kind of things that they care about, each of these individuals care about. Esteban, can, can we talk about the last, uh, about the last, yeah, about this one sure. for a second? Uh, so what, what was the question? You approach like I see different uh, colors, and I guess this is a behavior, individual behavior. Well, what this is is th these are the. This is what I use when we're developing personas, and that's what I was going to talk about next. Which where personas are essentially archetypes of your audience that you then find out a lot of details about the different aspects of their lives, and and depending upon the situation, you can look at different kinds of dimensions. In this case, we were talking about. We wanted to brainstorm on what their motivations were, what their fears were, what kind of things they experienced in the world that were frustrating to them, um, what kinds of tasks they undertook, things like that. If we brainstorm on ideas like that within a certain kind of structure, what we're able to do is we're able to develop a much richer idea of who these people are. In fact, what we wind up actually calling the personas, which is what, what I was going to point out next, um, what we wind up calling the personas are really an empathy framework because what they're so valuable in doing is not only capturing the empathy that the organization currently has for its consumers, but actually creating an artifact that for even people who weren't with us in the session that they can then access this deeper feeling and connection with who the audiences are. Um, but we use the similar kind of uh, brainstorming when we're beginning to think about how a particular audience works through the different media out there. So we'll con conduct a similar brainstorming on um, what are the media that they use, what are the, what are the messages that they need to hear. But the, the whole point in that is we're trying to add depth, but depth from the point of view that all of the participants can bring from their experience both as individuals and also their knowledge about the way that the consumers actually work. So in this case, I wanted to go ahead and kind of tell you that personas are a very important tool for what we do. Uh, and I personally have been involved in personas and developing personas for a really long time. Uh, most people remember that the one of the primary, primary uh, organizations to promote personas was Forrester Research. Well, part of the reason Forrester Research fell in love with this was because of the work I was doing with Organic, with the client first Chrysler uh, Motors, you know, and as well also another, which was my, my individual client, which was Carter's Kidswear, where we began to explore, hmm, you know, maybe companies need something richer than just profiles based on demographic and media behavior as a way to access what their brand should be about and their brand experiences should be about. So by now, pretty much most people have heard the term personas. Our approach, though, kind of takes it to another level by bringing in empathy and, and creating this tool that can be used throughout the organization. Um, did that answer your question? Yes. yes. Okay, great. Well, the key thing, and I think this is what's really important about what, what you, you're bringing up, one of the things that I loved when I was doing this work and that I found that, that just kind of brings it in, in, together in in a meaningful way, is this quote by, by Peter Merholtz of HBR. And that's really the single tool that does the best job at spreading empathy throughout a business is the persona. And we've actually seen this so much in the way that, that we work. Um, one of the things that, you know, one of the ways I can tell that this is working is literally within hours or days of conducting a, a workshop focused on developing personas, if we can be in a situation with a client and you can hear the client say, oh, that's a Peter, or in this case, oh, that's a Sarah. Sarah would hate that. And Peter would, would, would never like that, you know, or, or would really love that. When you can get them to adopt the language of this common ground of something external to their normal work lives, it's, it shows that this is actually working. 
I mean, how much worse would it be? It, it would be so much worse if they were saying, well, sales and marketing would never like that. Or, you know, our uh, distributors would really, you know, in terms of their logistics, would really not like that or whatever. And although those decisions and those kind of perspectives need to be taken in, in an organization or a team that's working together really effectively, there's not a lot of emotional connection with those kind of things. Whereas when they see these, these their audiences in real life, it begins to make a much better impression on kind of what they're doing and more relevant to their daily kind of activities. So, you know, in addition to personas, we've taken this and we've kind of spread this out in a bunch of other tools that we use. Uh, experience strategies, so essentially what we consider requirements uh, that organizations think about in terms of if developing the relationship that they want with, with consumers. Like, what are the things that we need to do in order to create this relationship? Consumer journeys, none of us approach a brand in a linear fashion. And so when companies think about their consumers, they want to think about all the different things that influence them, all the different ways that, that, that different channels that people come to learn about a brand and then use a brand, uh, as well as the, th the other thing that is really important about consumer journeys is we can begin to understand where in that pathway is the right moment to, to, to confront them with the right messages to promote the right behaviors. So we can start to take a much more analytical and kind of disciplined approach to messaging. And then finally, engagement platforms. I mean, that's actually thinking more like it's, it's basically a media strategy kind of squared and taken to put on steroids in that you're not just thinking about media in terms of, you know, the effectiveness in, 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 in a particular case, but you're thinking about, well, what do you want to be doing with that uh, in, in an engagement pattern as well? So it can include, you know, surveys, it can include all kinds of other ways that you want to touch the, the consumer. But again, all of these things are structured on the idea of having an empathetic feeling for the way consumers move through the life cycle. Another thing that we do with our clients is we we use pictures. You know, like the saying says, a picture says a thousand words. Well, this is an example of how we were able to work with the Chicago Yacht Club again and begin to describe what that brand experience was really all about to its different kind of consumers. In this case, it was passion for the for activity on the water, whether it's sailing or power boating. The community, the social aspect of being a member of a club with people who all like the same things, um, the productivity and utility of different tools that allow members to get the most of their membership, and then also this kind of clarity of focus around what the role that they felt that the yacht club plays in their lives. These pictures really help unite people in ways that many times just common paragraphs and other things don't don't really work. Um, the other thing that I think is really interesting in what we do in terms of bringing empathy to, to life with our clients is we use it again as a way to return to the data and the research that they gather as a way for them to make the connections between the discoveries that we make in our workshops and work sessions, whether for personas or strategy or consumer journeys or whatever, to help bring that in and show that there's a direct link between that and the actual end result that they're looking for. So this is a case where, you know, this app that was the shopping app for local and, and local merchants and local shoppers for causes, this was able, we were able to actually help get them to look beyond all the information that they had about millennials and what millennials care about to begin to start to almost even take a gamification approach in that realizing a lot of the things millennials really care about was creating something that allowed them to, to kind of look at how they performed and show the effects of what they do over a long term. So this was this was a way that they could start to see how the different things that they did were that were doing good actually compared to their own their own behavior, their own history, but also others and created a social dimension and gaming dimension to the to app that they hadn't necessarily thought of at the beginning. Um, finally, just to kind of go over what I feel are some of the big things in terms of using empathy and what we do with our clients and what they find is really this idea that people actually collaborate. In a lot of situations, it's, you know, it's, it's working together, but with very specific uh, lines that are drawn. People definitely collaborate together in teams much better when they work through this process. Um, the second idea is that insight becomes the common, sorry, common currency. 
So it's not really just about the facts and the data that someone can cite as they're discussing and debating things, but it's really, the question becomes, is, like, is this really creating and delivering an insight that we can then use to take us to the next level? The third was, I, I mentioned a little bit, what, but one of the things that happens when team members become enlisted is they think less about the lines that are restricting their contribution and they extend much more into and are much more sold on, on what they can do for the organization and to move it kind of forward. And then finally, this idea that people work together much better as a team. There's this, there's this common sense of affection and focus on the audience that just doesn't happen, I think, in, in normal ways. So I'm going to leave you with some final thoughts, which actually some, some final thoughts in terms of what, where I hope that you take this information uh, that I've presented to you today. Um, first of all, is that to understand, we have a little bit better sense that brands aren't really about what you do. And the tendency usually is for startups, and, and, and it's been my experience, is that People in this kind of situation, they always want to tell you about what their product is and how, they, how it does something differently. Um, but the idea really is, is when you're thinking about a brand, the brand's really about what you mean. So it's not just what you do, but what do you mean in the world? How are you creating value for very specific people that is different than the way anyone else is doing it in, this, in, in the world? And I think this is an important message to take. The other thing to take is that the brand isn't really just about communications. It's not really about your logo. It's not just about your tagline and your colors and your UI. Um, it's really a tool for making business decisions. So from everything about understanding whether you're reaching the right audience or maybe there's an audience that you haven't thought of that are you've left on the sidelines that is actually a really important audience. Things like creating differentiation. So, I mean, nowadays everyone's trying to stand out from the crowd. So, what are the things that are going to make you stand out from the crowd? Those are business decisions. Focusing and getting more value from the research and the other inputs that you that you take in to help you make decisions. Which ones? Which ones are going to be the most valuable? Uh, developing new offerings. You know, reshaping and evolving what you, what it is that you put in the market. Leveraging digital, social, and mobiles in the right way. How is it going to have the most effect on the audiences that, that you want to reach um, for particular purposes? And then also, again, zooming out and thinking about everything as an experience and how experiences themselves are kind of the fundamental building blocks of how we create relationships. All these things, I think, are really important. Um, so as, you, as, as I kind of wind up, what I... What I would encourage you to do is to take a look at the problems and the issues and the challenges that you face and see if, you know, ask yourself, thinking empathetically from the point of view of the different kind of audiences out there, even internal audiences, and you're dealing with coders, you're dealing with whatever, thinking empathetically, can it offer some new insights into how you're creating value in the world and the ways and the directions and the tools that you could create that can help you stabilize and kind of accelerate the growth that that you're experiencing or, or moving towards you know and in this sense um, one of the one of the things that, that I would recommend is think about it as a process that is very scalable so whether you're a lean enterprise or whether you're you know much more developed along the way think about how this can apply kind of across the board and it's it's pretty it's pretty straightforward you know start with your audiences Think about insights, not just information. Think about insights that reflect the value and the values that, that these audiences are, are working under. Don't skimp on strategy. The tendency is to kind of say, well, you, strategy, you, you think about strategy when there's emergency. Um, but the truth is, if you think about strategy as an organic and evolving thing, then at the beginning, it's, it's actually very important for laying down the right foundation. Uh, and even more, think about strategy as a tool that you can use to, most importantly, prioritize. You know, prioritize for the brand, prioritize for partners. You know, what, what essentially, use it as the, as the metric and common discussion point for beginning to think about how you want to make, make certain decisions that help you move forward. Uh, and then I think the other, the final thing is, is to see that, that strategy and that empathy and thinking about your brand should be a part of the entire process. You should find ways to incorporate that at all points as the organization develops. 
and, and to learn from what it is that you, that you discover. And then finally, I think uh, all of you are you know, in the business of you know, being entrepreneurs and starting things new and starting things different and thinking in new ways. And so this will ring particularly true for all of you, I'm sure. And that is nothing significant happens until a pattern is broken. And I hope what I've shown you is that empathy is a very effective way to begin to kind of break those patterns using a tool that we all possess and that is, is increasingly more relevant as we make, you know, make business decisions. You are an expert for branding and you're here actually not for work, for business, you are here for a wedding. You are here for a wedding, pleasure, yeah? yes. And <laughs> for pleasure and we just caught you on the way, yes. right? And so for this, uh, you made this presentation especially for us. So perhaps you come here one day and make workshops. For I would love to. It would be great. I love Israel. It's a fabulous place and an incredible amount of entrepreneurial energy and smarts and, and really great companies. So I look forward to that. Okay, so please let us know uh, of any uh, future intentions. <laughs> I okay, will. We'll, we'll uh, let everyone know and if someone will uh, want uh, these workshops, uh, sure. And actually, let me give my contact information again. Okay. Again, my name is Esteban Gonzalez, and uh, my email is here, as well as our website. So take a look at the site, and hopefully you gain something out of this. I know I enjoyed telling you about this particular approach. So thank you again. Sure. And, uh, thank you, everyone, for watching us uh, for the second uh, season of hi and Boston Tech Webinars Project. We are delighted to have a second year uh, with our sponsors as well, and I hope you enjoyed, and we'll just uh, see you soon or hear you soon on the next session. All the best, everyone.